Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Data Flowcast. I'm your host, Kenton Danis, and today I'm joined by Alexander Booth, the Assistant Director of R&D for the Texas Rangers Baseball Club. Um, Alexander, how are you doing? Uh, not so bad. Kind of had a tough game yesterday, but uh, right. the season still looks in good shape here. I'm very excited to kind of see if we can go back to back with 2023 right. in terms yeah. of uh, winning the World Series, that is. Yeah, yeah. High high bar to top for sure. Um, yeah, and so you guys are just just getting started with you know, the general season, is that right? Yep, the season's about one month of the way through, so we've still got the whole summer to go here. Okay, but it is really interesting. These do these early games do count. We've already played uh, seven games against the Astros, which is a lot, and wow. three games against Seattle. So some of these in division rivals, but I'm very excited to kind of have some high pressure games throughout the entire year, yeah. as opposed to maybe just in September. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I'm admittedly uh, not the biggest follower of baseball, but in my defense, I am from Seattle originally, and that's where I live now. So I think growing up, we, you know, the Mariners don't have the greatest track record. Um, so it was uh, not the most fun one to follow. But yeah, no, definitely understand. Seattle's a great team this year, though. So it's a really fun division to be in with uh, Seattle's great pitching staff. And you can never count out the Astros and the Angels are still, of course, with Mike Trout. They're always a threat. So. Uh, it's a, definitely an exciting year in baseball. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'm sure we'll have lots of local people jumping on the bandwagon because as it gets more exciting. Well, yeah, that's great. Um, well, hope your future games go better than yesterday's, of course. Um, well, let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about say, how the Texas Rangers use data to win games and how you got started with Airflow uh, and some of the use cases that Airflow powers today for you. So. Let's start to give everybody a lay of the land. Um, maybe talk a little bit about your role, um, Texas Rangers Baseball Club. How long have you been there and what do you do for them? Yeah, definitely. So my role is the Assistant Director of Research and Development within Baseball Operations for the Texas Rangers. I've been at the club since 2018, so this is going to be my seventh season. And when I started, I was maybe the fourth or fifth person on their data analytics R&D side. So just for clarity, I do work on the baseball operation side. So that is the money ball side of things where we can interact with players, recommend trades, look at contracts, then of course, recommend strategy on and off the field across all leagues and levels of our minor league and major league development system. Um, so in my current role as assistant director of R&D, I work with strategizing and architecting our modern kind of big data ecosystem. Uh, you may not think big data in baseball or data is uh, where we're kind of that data lies in baseball now. And it's really fascinating to see that since 2021, there's been kind of an explosion in technology in the space. We now have multiple cameras at every single stadium. We're doing pose tracking. We're looking at biomechanics, the movement of the body. We're tracking the players and the balls at hundreds of frames per second for the entire game. And that data is not only just coming to us from the major leagues, but also the minor league side, even the amateur side. Some of the Division I schools, LSU, Vanderbilt, Florida, Wake Forest, they have these high tech systems in place now as well. So with this rapid rise of kind of big data in baseball, how do we make that available? How do we transform it? How do we run AI and machine learning on it to help make better decisions at the end of the day? Because that's what data is in baseball at the end of the day. It's a decision-making tool. How can we have confidence in the players that we put on the field? How can we have confidence in the lineup? How do we have confidence in the trades that we use and recommend? And that's all going to be furnished with data driving those decisions in addition to the domain expertise, of course, of the coaches and people that have been in the game for many, many years. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a really big jump in just a short amount of time, three years, I think, at Astronomer, you know, we're used to thinking of big data for everything. But as you said, um, a lot of people probably don't associate that as much with baseball. And that seems like it's even a pretty new development in terms of obviously the history of the sport. So that's and really it's, cool. Yeah, it's really interesting how uh, Major League Baseball even uh, advertises this now. If you watch a Major League Baseball broadcast, you'll see highlights in the game of kind of the ball being tracked and say, oh, this home run went 450 feet and you get a little animation behind it. And it says powered by StatCast. So StatCast originally started in 2015, but there's been so many iterations on it. First, it was only tracking baseballs and it was only doing that at a fraction of the frame rate. Then they started adding in the player tracking. Then they started adding in kind of bat tracking and biomechanics tracking. We now track the bat at 300 frames a second, which is just crazy. 
And then also kind of new last year was weather tracking. So we now get weather data for every single batted ball event. Uh, so we can look exactly at how the wind impacted your hit. And that's important to us because we play in a, in, a roo- in a closed roof stadium most of the year. We do open the roof, maybe about 10% of our games. Uh, but when we play with a closed roof, there's obviously no wind. So if you play in a park like Wrigley, so that's in Chicago, uh, the wind typically helps get a lot of extra home runs pushed out to the outfield. So that player, if they played in our stadium, they probably wouldn't hit as many home runs because of that uh, wind impact. So it's just really interesting to see how kind of this new data is shaping some data strategies as well as interpretations of finding that true talent of the player themselves. Yeah, that's really cool. I would imagine in a game um, in a series that's so, so competitive, having even that minor advantage that the data can give you is really important. Definitely. Yeah. So with kind of that massive increase in both the amount of data that you're collecting for all of these different use cases that you've already mentioned and um, kind of implementing that even just within the last couple of years, maybe talk a little bit about how you did that. Obviously, we talk a lot about Airflow on this podcast, so can we talk about how Airflow fits into that as well? Yeah, definitely. So Airflow has been instrumental in how we organize and manage our data orchestrations. Um, And this started just because the players wanted their data. They wanted their data faster. A lot of modern baseball players are growing up actually in little league and high school and college surrounded by reports about how they're performing. They're surrounded around with their own data about how they are as a player and their benchmarks that they need to hit. So when they reach our system, whether through the draft or through signings, they're asking for these reports as fast as possible. And so not only do we have these big data sets that we need to transform, join together, organize, but then we also need to get them in front of our players as fast as possible with a rigorous schedule. So when we needed a scalable solution that could scale with the amount of data vendors that we had, as well as allow for those interdependencies between data pipelines, which I'll probably start calling DAGs here. This is the Airflow Pipe uh, podcast, right? Uh, So all of our different DAGs that kind of take data from the weather, from the player tracking, from the ball tracking, from the minor leagues, from college, how do we kind of start transforming those, organizing them, shaping them together, and then kind of driving that forward and making sure that they run as quickly and as seamlessly as possible. Uh, There's been a lot of new innovations in Airflow in the last few years that we have really taken advantage of. Uh, I think one of the first being kind of that data set aware scheduling. Uh, we just updated actually to Airflow 2.9, uh, I think last week, maybe the week before. So 2.9 has a really great update where you can actually have multiple data sets, kind of have some and or operators, as well as adding some time-based scheduling there. Uh, so that's a big use case for us. How do we kind of have these different data sets that still have dependencies on each other? Again, I need both the ball tracking and the player tracking to be done before I then kind of make a DAG to kind of send out the reports or join that data together. So ha- having those be data set aware uh, in our DAGs has been very, very helpful. Uh, plus, it's been very great to scale um, as we we have we get a new agreements with new data vendors every single like week, it feels like. And so being able to ingest those pipelines and then again, schedule them and be able to combine them with our existing data sets and our existing DAG workflows We needed that scalable solution and we love kind of airflow there because of that. And of course, I I can just talk about airflow all day. I also, we're huge fans of the open source community. Uh, When I kind of moved into this role in 2021, uh, 2022, I made a push to really invest and utilize open source uh, solutions. Of course, we've been burned in the past with vendor lock-in. We've been burned in the past with specific vendors not iterating or including new features that maybe we specifically needed to want to help or that we wanted to use for our use cases. Now, so of course, Airflow being open source has been a huge driver of that. We've actually submitted a couple of issues uh, that got resolved by the community, which is really awesome to see and hear, um, specifically around some of the Databricks operators and the BigQuery operators. Those are two of our main kind of data platforms that we have in baseball. Um, And so that just... The constant attribution to open source, the way that the community innovates and progressively makes new and awesome releases of the product uh, made it, again, like a natural fit for us, especially kind of with our partnership with Astronomer and Airflow, too. Oh, that's so awesome. I work with the Airflow community a lot in my day to day, and I have to say this is like the ideal Airflow user that you're describing to me having an early upgrade story. I mean, 2.9 was just released 
two weeks ago. So the fact that you're already using it and um, yeah, making use of those new features is so great to hear. And we obviously love stories about people actually like giving that feedback back. I know the folks developing Airflow really, really care about that um, and value it a lot. So that's, yeah, the, that's the, really cool to hear. The timing was really serendipitous because we like just had a problem maybe about a month ago where we needed like two data sets to also run on a time if like regardless. And we were like, we had some like code, we couldn't like, we were, it was a really, really bad code that we were trying to get working in the existing airflow. And then I read some of the like upcoming release notes and I was like, wait a second, let's just put a, pot, a pin in this for like two weeks. It seems like not, and that's the other great thing about open source. If you have a problem, you're typically not the only one that's had this kind of problem or difficulty. And just being able to, again, have that open collaboration and conversation around this and work as a community towards that solution is awesome. So again, we've been submitting issues. I'm hoping to kind of be more impactful in that open source community moving forward. Uh, but that is, again, one of the great reasons why we utilized Airflow for our modern orchestration strategy. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that particular feature that you're talking about uh, that was just released being able to schedule on uh, or have more advanced conditional data set scheduling was maybe one of the most frequently requested features we've seen from the community since the original data sets came out back in Airflow 2.4. Um, obviously, just it kind of changes the game with what you can do in terms of event based triggering, which it sounds like for you when you have so many different data sets that your uh, pipelines are dependent on can be really important. Yeah, definitely. And the event base is huge as well. Like I said, the players want their information quickly. And a lot of that is right after a game. At the major league level, we can't supply reports during a game like you actually may see in the NBA or in the NFL uh, due to some, well, let's just say nefarious uh, uh, <laughs> cheating scandals that happened a few years ago. Uh, their MLB is really restricted in what can be communicated during a game. But as soon as the game is over, the game is fresh. The baseball hitter whose home run was robbed at the at the wall, they're upset about that. But being able to see the report that says, hey, that was a home run in 29 out of 30 parks. Our metrics, our KPIs say you did a really, really good hit there. Keep trying like that and you're going to be great. Or the pitcher whose strike three call was actually called a ball by the umpire and he's mad about it and now he ended up walking the guy. They want to look at the at the data immediately. So as soon as we get the pitch, as soon as we know that the pitch has been processed, that's when we want to start triggering some of these DAGs, start triggering some of these pipelines to start getting that data already ready to go. So as soon as the final pitch is thrown in the ninth, the DAGs have already run. We already kind of have those reports available and the players can digest that immediately. Uh, Baseball is a marathon, not a sprint. It's a 162 game season. So we can't wait 24 hours. By the time it's tomorrow, they're already focusing on that day's game, preparing with that day's data for that night's pitcher. Uh, so it's really important to get that speed and velocity in terms of return time for those, uh, for those data uh, reports. So being able to use data sets, being able to have that event base, that almost micro batch or to an extent, almost streaming pipelines. Uh, through those DAGs have been more than valuable in our kind of revolutionized new ecosystem here. Yeah, yeah. It's great to hear about that use case where Airflow is really impacting kind of the success of the team and your players. Um, maybe for that, you know, delivering reports directly after the game, um, anything specific you can talk about in terms of like what what is being tracked during the game and uh, the data that you're using? Um, kind of in what way is that being given to the players afterwards so that they can improve any fun stories there? Yeah, definitely. So in our World Series run last year, a big conversation around us was, of course, winning on the road. But beyond that, looking at a more micro view at specifically the games, uh, we had a really increase. We had, we had a huge increase in our defensive ability. And there was a lot of conversation around how kind of we were able to be in the right spot at the right time or of course, our players are really, really great at defending and they have a lot of innate talent in that. Uh, but during the course of last year, we really wanted to focus on how can we optimize our defensive positioning recommendations. So before the game, we have a whole set of machine learning models that permutate and figure out based on the count, based on the pitcher, based on if runners are on base, where should our second baseman stand? Where should our shortstop stand? And then that's going to give them, again, given their talent, the best likelihood of being able to make a play at the ball. 
So, of course, the players don't always remember where exactly they need to stand. So, of course, we do have that player tracking during the game. Uh, so this is, again, one of those items where after the game is over, we're able to sit down and look at these reports. We have our recommended positioning where we said, hey, this is where we thought you should stand given the situation. And here's where you actually stood. And then we can watch the video, see how the play was made, and then say, oh, it didn't really matter. You made the play anyway. Or great job. You stood at the spot and it really helped you make the play. And then, of course, kind of the sometimes when they don't send anywhere near the data recommendation and they miss the play. We can use that as, again, motivation to stand kind of in our preferred recommended spot. So that's what, another one of these big data sources because the players are being tracked at three at 30 frames a second across a three-hour game. That ends up being a lot of information to process and bring in. But having that ready after the game is over to look at and connect to, again, the video as well as the players themselves and their own experiences really drives home that point. Uh, so I thought that was a really interesting story. We had a lot of great double plays. We had a lot of great catches in the outfield as well as in the infield. And of course, so much of that has to be attributed to the players. But I like to think that the data helped a little bit in recommending that they stand in the right spot so that they're more able to make the play given their talent. And I think my last story I'll mention there too, we talked a little bit about the weather. Uh, this actually had a huge impact in the ALDS last year. Uh, so in the ALDS, we played Baltimore, the Baltimore Orioles. And the first two games were actually in Baltimore. So Baltimore, they moved their left field fence further back. So it's technically harder to hit home runs to left field. But again, looking at the weather, we kind of knew that the wind was kind of blowing out to left field that day. Uh, so we stacked some guys in the lineup that maybe had a little bit more power to that side of the field, which people don't normally do in Camden Yards, and ended up with Mitch Garver hitting like a grand slam in the in, the, in game two, which was really, really great to see. And we went on to, of course, uh, win both of those games on the road. So I think it's really interesting to see how data is shaping the game. And because of technologies like Airflow, that's able to organize, orchestrate, and connect various different DAGs and various different data pipelines and even across various cloud ecosystems. I mentioned BigQuery a little bit. We also have a presence on AWS and Databricks. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts to where this data is going. And there's also a lot of moving parts to how it gets consumed through various BI tools, through various web applications. So again, having that unified system to connect all of those disparate points, again, quickly, and effectively has been just such a revolution to us. And before we kind of moved into this airflow space, it was a lot of uh, cron jobs, a lot of task manager or task scheduler on local machines. Uh, so again, just it's been um, a completely new paradigm uh, in data orchestration and data movement. And again, that commitment to open source and the community, I can see why so many people are passionate about the product in this space. Yeah. That's those are two really cool stories. Um, and I think, you know, ML applications and like ML ops and using that airflow is kind of a really hot topic right now. Um, and so you're talking about, you know, using the data to model kind of where your players should stand or how the weather is going to impact them ahead of time and using that to provide recommendations. Um, what where do you think Airflow kind of stands out for those use cases? I mean, you mentioned a little bit about it sitting at the middle and kind of connecting with all of these other tools. Um, for those, you know, machine learning applications specifically, uh, any kind of learning that you've had there after implementing Airflow as that central orchestrator? Yeah, definitely. I think it all depends on having that kind of modern AI architecture already defined. So whether it's in SageMaker, you know, that's the AWS uh, machine learning hosting environment, whether it's in kind of BigQuery uh, ML, whether it's in Azure ML or Databricks, or even kind of what we've experimented with is actually having kind of a physical like model that we've containerized and then be able to interact with that container using kind of Airflow too. Uh, so of course, Airflow as that main orchestration piece can connect with all of that. But I think that's a really important piece of the data pipeline is having some conditional logic in the DAGs to say, all right, what data is coming in and where should it be routed to? Which model should it be routed to to get this prediction? Or should it even be going through a model? Is there enough confidence in the values? We have a lot of missing values, null values, outliers. And so we're doing a lot of work now to detect when a baseball is recorded to be thrown at 140 miles an hour, which is impossible. 
that maybe we shouldn't necessarily make a prediction on that pitch. Uh, but being able to have that conditional logic, being able to have dynamic tasks, that's been another big use case we've had in, uh, in Airflow, being able to take 300 pitches or maybe that was only 295 and be able to blast them out as individual tasks to be run through in a machine learning model to get those individualized predictions back. Um, and I think just the way to, to continue being that connector, being able to host all these different ways that uh, and that organizations are competing with AI, again, whether it's containerized systems, whether it's with APIs, whether it's with cloud-based partners. And I think just continued support there as well as continued flexibility and how those predictions should interact with existing data pipelines and DAGs is where the community is going to be going with uh, that continued integration, at least in my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's spot on from from my experience as well. And um, obviously cool to hear about that use case. I think Airflow has a lot of kind of features of a generic orchestrator that help a lot when implementing that sort of work at scale that you obviously could not do with a cron job um, yeah. or something more more rudimentary. Uh, so yeah. that's cool. To hear. I think the, the dynamic task, uh, that example in baseballs may not have been the best one. I think maybe a better one is on games. So not ev every day there's a different number of games played. Sometimes every team plays. Sometimes there's rain delays. Sometimes uh, teams have off days. Then you incorporate minor league systems as well. So typically the way our pipelines work is we need to figure out what games happened yesterday or today. And then for each game, go off and get all the pitches that were tracked for that game. So having a dynamic way to figure out how many games were played or having that flexibility to just create those requests in parallel using dynamic tasks has been uh, an awesome feature. Uh, and we've been able to scale that really effectively using some of the scheduler manipulations and uh, I can't remember what the other one was. Gosh, it was like the the cluster, I was like the cluster assignment behind the scenes okay. to be able to optimize the the, uh, the, the slots uh, so we didn't end up uh, running into any uh, rate limiting issues. Interesting. Yeah. Since you've already upgraded to 2.9 and you are using dynamic task mapping, have you tried the new custom naming of mapped task instances? That was another Hi. big feature in 2.9. I have not. We've been all focused in on the data sets as okay. well as some of the UI stuff. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, the display names for data. I'm, okay, yeah. Yeah. I think a big one for, especially in cases like yours where you've got like a massive, you know, potentially massive number of tasks uh, each time it's running. It's just previously you would have, you know, an index number yeah. of instance. So if something failed, you would go, all right, well, instance 40 failed. What is instance 40? Which game is that referring to? So... Now you can assign those names programmatically. It just makes oh the management a lot easier. Um, another fun thing that came out just a couple of weeks ago. That's I like I am like actually super excited about this feature because yes, yeah, so we do have like zero to forty, and I'm like, well, game number thirty seven failed, and I'm like, I have no idea what game number thirty seven is. So I'm either going deep into the logs because I'm having too many print statements out. But uh, that is a very, very, very exciting update. So yeah, as you said, it's a very fun feature. And I'm sure now that we're already on 2.9, that's something that I'll be putting into practice uh, maybe today, actually. Yeah, that's awesome. My, Like I said, my team does a lot of work with the community and talking about new Airflow features. And I think this, this has been really fun. Some of these, I think, are just very approachable. You know, everybody's familiar with baseball and loves watching it. So uh, these are fun examples, I think, that we can take. Um, and say, hey, this is how somebody in the community is using this feature. Um, well, it's really yeah, cool. yeah, definitely. It's again, next time you're watching a game, every single ball that's thrown, every ball that's hit, every movement that somebody does, it's being tracked. And we want to use that information to make better decisions about the strategy of the game, best way we can win, the interpretation of the player performance. And it's with Airflow that we're able to connect all of those different vendors that are able to connect all those different data points that are being extracted and then of course through the use of ai and ml be able to make those better decisions uh, at speed and at velocity and at scale and i think that's really the unsung hero part in our data orchestration and the, our big data ecosystem yeah yeah that's great to hear well i know um we are about at our scheduled time and we really appreciate you taking the time to join us today um what's the best way for folks to get in touch with you yeah definitely so you can always find me on linkedin at alexander booth uh, that's probably the best way to get in touch. Uh, otherwise, uh, 
Yeah, I don't think any of my other social medias are public, so maybe I need to after this. Uh, you and me both. Um, all right. Well, thanks again, Alexander. We really appreciate hearing your story. It's super interesting. Yeah, no, thanks for the opportunity to talk and excited to kind of continue seeing where the community goes. And uh, if you have any other kind of ways for us to kind of continue to provide feedback or uh, recommendations for new features, would love to continue being a part of that open source community. So yeah, yeah thanks yeah. for the opportunity here to speak. Yeah, of course. Thanks again. Thank you.